Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham Show. Today we are going to talk about gaining visibility through proactive public relations and strategic social media. This is going to get juicy, I have a feeling, just because this is a hot topic. A lot of entrepreneurs struggle with being visible. I think anytime there's a mindset barrier, that mindset barrier that leads to fear and then anxiety and all those negative thoughts, we tend to hide behind our business and do things in the back end, but we're not visible. And I can tell you just from experience that being visible, and I think you can define visibility for yourself. Every single person has their own form of visibility. But for me, the more visible I am front and center in my business, doing PR, doing social media and being strategic about it, the more opportunities I have. So we're going to dive into that today with my very special guest, Allie Martin from Kentucky. And you get to hear her Southern accent, which I love. But without any further ado, I'm going to bring her on. Allie Martin, welcome to the Robin Graham Show. Thank you so much, Robin. I'm really excited to be here. I'm just honored to be on the show. Great. It's an honor to have you. I love having experts. And I think visibility is, like I said in the intro, one of those things that people get a little bit hung up on because we see all of this stuff online that makes us think we have to be perfect or we have to be a certain way or do certain things. And I think just the advent of reels has really put a lot of people into that downward spiral of fear of being on social media because they think they have to do everything trending and they have to dance and perform and do all these things. And the reality is, no, nobody does. We have to just be ourselves. So I think this is going to, this conversation is going to lend so much value to everyone who listens. So thank you for being here. And Let's dive in by having you tell the listeners a little bit about you and your background and how you landed in this space of being a visibility expert. Yes. As you mentioned, I'm based in Kentucky. I own Fame and Fortune, which is a public relations and social media agency. We work specifically with female business owners. I have a background in public relations specifically. I worked in the corporate environment, the nonprofit environment, an agency world, retail space. So I've worked with brands like Amazon. I worked in their public relations for the Southeast region of the United States. Uh, Brands like Kendra Scott, Alta the International Spa Association. And through all of my work with them, I was really able to find these tactics that female business owners should be doing in their business, but weren't doing. And I think you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said like, we're overwhelmed with all of these things that we should be doing. And that tends to just shut us down. We just don't Mm -hmm. do anything at all because we get overwhelmed. So that's why I started Fame and Fortune. And I'm just, I'm now celebrating three years in business and just am so glad that I took this step because I've been able to see this growth that happens when people are able to step into who they really are and show up online and show up for their customers and for their business. So I love everything you just said. And let's talk about one of the brands you mentioned, because I love her jewelry, Kendra Scott. I think that she is a great example of being visible authentically so that you can attract the right people. The problem that I see a lot of times is that people are attracting clients that are not a good fit and they end up not being fulfilled. They end up frustrated, aggravated, annoyed, whatever phrase you want to use, because they don't they haven't put themselves out there in the right way to attract the right people to them. And I like to think of it as there's this magnet and then technically, scientifically, this is a true thing where our cells are all producing that vibration and that energy inside our bodies. And if we can solve a problem for someone and there's somebody else that has those, the opposite end of those, (laughs) that energy, those cells that need us and that magnet's going to bring us together to them. But the only way that can actually happen where we can truly marry our problem solving abilities and the solution we can provide with their problem is by being visible, but being visible in our true authentic self. And I know we hear this all the time and it's kind of like wrong because (laughs) what does that even mean? But so I would love for you to talk a little bit about using her as an example and how you helped her be visible in a way that was true to her to attract the right people who are going to wear her jewelry and wear it in a way that shines, not only helps them shine, but helps her shine. 
So I will back you up in saying that it is truly a scientific event that happens. It is a psychological event that's called parasocial relationship. So when we show up online, we show our face, we are able to build trust with those customers that have that need. So when we're able to say, this is what we do, this is what we are an expert in, and there's somebody out there watching that that has a need, there is that instant connection. And whether we want it to be ions that are positive and negative that are coming together, regardless of whatever that is, it is truly a trust building activity that if we're not doing it, it's not happening. And I will say, Kendra Scott already had this down when before I started to work with her, but she is excellent at telling her story. She tells the story of how she made jewelry in her guest bedroom when her son was just newly born. She didn't want to go back to the corporate environment, and she made all the, this jewelry, put it in a tea box, and then walked down the streets of Austin and sold it to the boutiques. That And then by the end of the day, she was sold out, and she went back and made more. And she just did that over and over again before she started to get orders from Nordstrom's and, and then really took off from there. And that story... She really has shared before that was not actually something that came natural to her because she had opened a hat store and she had to close that hat store because it didn't succeed. She felt talking about making jewelry in your bedroom and then walking down the streets. That was really one of those grass efforts, things that most people couldn't really connect with. She is so authentic to what that story is. And she tells it so often that it truly became the Kendra Scott story that then fueled other people to connect with her. And so I really just want to highlight that because I think so often women, particularly, we want to pull away from those stories of failure or what we're calling as failure or where we didn't think we shined and maybe not the glorious parts of our story. We want to be telling other people, but in the long run, when we can look back and see that whole story, that big picture, it really does allow our potential customers to connect with us and understand that we are people buy from people. They don't buy from companies. So when we can tell that story of a very personal event, it again, builds that trust. And we know with marketing, you have to know the company, you have to like the company, you have to trust the company. And so the, these methods of showing up in on camera where they can see your face and then telling that authentic story, whether it's this beautiful picture, roses and daisies or not, builds that final step of trust with your customers. 100%. And I preach this all the time. I know the listeners get tired of hearing me say it. So I'm so happy that you're saying it because it's just like <laughs> yes, reiteration without me. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about that for a second. And I love grassroots story. I love people who, I don't want to use the term hustle, but it, I'm not sure what other word to use, but they really had a lot of courage and audacity to do what she did and take that stuff that she made, the jewelry, the pieces that she made and go and present it to people face to face. And how often do people actually do that anymore? We don't hear of, this is a kind of a funny story. My grandfather was a door to door. This was, I don't even know how many years ago, door to door vacuum cleaner salesman. He sold more vacuums to women who had only hardwood floors in their homes than you can imagine. And this was back in the, what, 50s? It's funny because you think of that historically as being something people did. You had the, the hat salesman, you mentioned the hat salesman and all these things that people did door to door. And that's not existent anymore. People don't even open their front doors anymore. So it's really an inspiring story to me that someone did that to launch what is now just an immensely successful brand and business. Yep. So let's talk about, we talked about showing up as our authentic selves, as our genuine selves, so that we can connect with the right people. Let's talk about other ways we can be visible. When you talk about proactive PR and you talk about strategic social media, let's dive into some of those tips or tools or tactics that you use with your clients to help them become more visible. I think uh, oftentimes I'll hear people associate public relations with websites like HARO, which mm -hmm. stands for Help a Reporter Out. And a lot of people subscribe to that email and look for opportunities through that email that comes out three times a day. And while I don't find anything wrong with that, I definitely encourage if you're looking for PR opportunities, that's a great place to start. But whenever I use the word proactive public relation, that is truly the act of us going out to seek our own media opportunities. 
Haro is more of a reactive approach. It, this is the journalist saying, hey, here are the needs I have. Can anybody fill the slot? And that's us saying, yeah, me. So when it comes to proactive public relations, I really like to preach this idea of pitching ourselves to the outlets that we want to be in, the dream media outlets that are out there. And that does start with being true and authentic to ourselves, telling that unique story. It also comes down to remembering that it's not about us. Yes, tell your authentic story, be true to yourself, but remember it's not about you. So what can these media outlets gain from having you as an expert on their platform, in their publication, on their TV show? What can you offer to the audience that they will find so valuable that they will be indebted to that outlet. When we think about what the goal is for media outlets nowadays, that is to gain audience and retain audience. And so anytime that they can offer something that audience is just craving, it is a perfect match made in heaven. And when you can give them all the pieces on a silver platter and say, here's the questions you can ask me, here's the points that I'm going to make in the interview, here's the talk, the talking points and the, the takeaways that the audience will receive whenever they walk away from this interview, that's when they will just go, yes, this is an immediate yes. So yes, I really like to integrate proactive public relations into your marketing strategy. If you finally feel like you're at that point where you're like, I want to get more visible. I want to show up in front of my audience. Where is that audience? And what are those outlets that they are devouring and getting their news from? And how can we get you into those publications? I love that. And I just listened to this interview with Brielle Cotter. She's, I don't know if you've heard of her. She's actually, she's in Kentucky. You are, I don't know the exact you've location, but yeah. Oh, you've met her. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. She, so she was talking about having that, like when you're composing that story and composing that pitch, but having that like personal breakthrough, that personal transformation, your business expertise, that thing that you're so good at, that you can really, you're the best at whatever that may be and then your passion story and she's she described how where you have those three things come together is where your genius lies in terms of connecting with other people so i love that you brought in that how can your story serve someone else because that is how you're going to build that connection so my question to you is and i'm sure a lot of the listeners have this is okay so now we know let's just say forbes is our dream audience that we want to get published in Forbes, how do we get them to notice us? Like how, and who do we pitch to within Forbes so that they can actually find us or this, uh, see us get our yes. pitch, whatever. <laughs> no, I, I love this because this is a real issue, Robin. This is really, I will have people tell me all the time I've pitched to Forbes, but they didn't write back or they didn't respond. So first of all, I will say when it comes to pitching really large media outlets and sometimes even smaller, you do have to follow up. And I always use the role follow up no less than three times. And I know that can seem sometimes extreme or people think, Ooh, I feel a little bit like a stalker, but no, truly they get thousands of pitches a day. And sometimes they can read one and consider it, but then, so they they haven't written back just yet, but then you pinging them again and again, will remind them to check back in with their editors. So follow-up is definitely a key. What yeah. frequency do you recommend? So you said no less than three times, but yeah. what frequency, like, is that once a week for three weeks? Is it every other week for six weeks? Like, how do you suggest yeah. that the listeners do that? I do once a week. And really the beyond three times is dependent on the topic that you're pitching. So if you're pitching something, for instance, International Women's Day is in March and early February, my team and I started to reach out to local media outlets and said, I'm a local female business owner. I work with female business owners. I'd love to come on in honor of International Women's Day. Now we started early February. So we had those three weeks to follow up in given that they were probably going to start planning about two or three weeks out with the segments that they were producing. Of course, beyond that, it would have been irrelevant. So keeping in mind what that topic, is it timely? Even something that's happening in the national news. If you want to reach out to your local outlet and say, I know this is happening on a national stage, but I'm a local expert and I can offer commentary on what's happening. That's the perfect story that a, a local media outlet would like. But of course, once that story is old news, it's not going to be necessarily something that they're going to be considering as a story. But 
whenever you are really thinking about those dream media outlets and trying to be strategic about working towards a feature in one of those, the best way you can do this is, and really the relations part of public relations comes into play here. I really like to follow those journalists on social media, so on Twitter, on Instagram, and start to reach out to them whenever they're publishing content that connects with you. So if they're posting about their dog all the time and you love dogs, responding back to that, having conversations on social media in regards to that. And really the logic behind this is not only to build a relationship, but when your name pops up in their inbox and they're looking at those thousands of pitches that they get in a day, your name will stand out because they've seen your name on other platforms before. So whether it's just a very surface level message back and forth on social media, it still is a recognizable name. Because when you think about it, you really only have two opportunities when you're sending an email pitch to a journalist. You have the name field and you have the subject line. So if your subject line doesn't catch their attention, we have to rely on our name to be able to catch Uh their attention. So that's really a great way to think long-term and say, One day I want to be in Forbes. So who is writing in Forbes that is similar to the topic that I would be interviewed about, finding them on social media and following them and starting a relationship there? That's awesome. Okay, so now we know that, but how do we actually find that person? Do you just Google like Forbes contributors, entrepreneur contributors, or maybe it's like Forbes contributors related to mindset or Forbes contributors related to women in business? Is that how you find them is just through Google or do you do those searches on social media? What do you suggest for that? Yeah, so there's definitely a couple different ways. So obviously, if you are consuming this publication and you are finding that there's one journalist in particular, maybe they're a columnist, maybe they're only writing about a specific topic, that's who you want to reach out to. And yes, you can find that via Google. You can find it by actually reading it and going back to this publication time and time again and seeing who are those names that are popping up over and over again. There's definitely contributors that contribute to multiple business publications. They can write for three or four of them. And so those Uh are really good to, to build relationships with, because even if it may not work for Forbes, it may work over here for Fortune or for entrepreneurs. Even names like that, that you might find on social media, just by finding a Forbes contributor on social media, that would be another great place to, to start to build a relationship. Okay. I love that. Those are such great tips. And it's funny because I follow certain journalists on Twitter and engage with, I'm not a huge Twitter person, but there is a reason to be there because that's where a lot of journalists hang out. And I interviewed Michelle Glogovac actually twice, but she does more podcast pitching. She's a podcaster. And one of our conversations was around pitching to podcast hosts versus pitching to traditional media. And we talked a little bit about the Twitter factor uh, Mm -hmm. and how you can use Twitter to engage with journalists. And I know that she's had immense success with that. I'm also not a big Twitter fan, but I find that I go there every time I'm looking for a journalist and then start to check in there for those conversations. And I will say, sometimes you'll even find journalists that are just sending out a quick tweet that says, I'm looking for a source in the home decor and industry. Does anybody know anybody? So if you can really stay on top of that feed and stay on top of those relationships, like that's another great opportunity where you can get a reactive opportunity up your sleeve. Yeah. Yeah. I love those little simple things that you can do that don't take a ton of time because it can be so overwhelming when you think, Oh, I now have to follow this person and engage with this person. But like you said, that is our opportunity to build relationships. And the better we are at building relationships, the more opportunities we're going to have. To me, and I talk about this a lot, that social media is not about selling. Social media is about building relationships, yes. engaging, and then building the no love and trust factor so that we can have people hire us. And I think it's the same exact thing for PR. It's just being there to build those relationships with people and it's recognizability. And the more you engage with them, the more recognizable you'll be and the more memorable you'll be, especially if you're giving them really valuable feedback on whatever it is they're posting. That, that's actually a great point because once you've helped out a journalist and they're in a bind, they've got a deadline in two hours and they need to interview a source and you're able to step in and fill that spot, they feel indebted to you. And then the next time they have an opportunity and 
granted, if they're writing about a topic, they typically are going to be writing about that topic over and over again. So if you have helped them out once, they will come back to you and say, hey, you helped me out again. I'm going to come to you first this time. What, what can you do? Can, do you want this opportunity? So I truly believe in the fact that if you stay on top of those tweets, if you stay on top of those relationships and you just help out once or twice, like you really are in at that point and you become that go-to source that they love working with. Yeah, I agree. And again, I can't stress that enough. It's that relationship building that really launches people. It's, there's nothing at all relevant when we talk about overnight success. People who have overnight success have been in the trenches building relationships and behind the scenes for a long time in order to get to where they are today or to be featured in those places where they're being featured. Okay, so let's talk about just briefly the strategic social media. So I love the proactive PR, I'm all about it. So now let's talk about the strategic social media and how people can be strategic with their social media so that they can become more visible. Yeah. So I think we've all heard about content pillars. That is truly the basis of all the social media that I'm working on for clients and then even myself. It is this idea of determining those nine to 12 subject matter that you want to return to every single month. And even though I think we've all know about it, I still find that business owners and particularly women aren't returning to it because we think, I've already talked about that. I can't repeat myself. I can't talk about it again. But the idea of branding really does come down to that rule of seven that people have to hear a message seven times in order for it to stick in their brain or for in order for them to take action on it. So this idea of keeping your content pillars very simple, even down to what are the services you offer? What are the products you offer? Who are the people on your team? What are testimonials from your clients? And then repeating that same topic every single month. And I find that actually helps you get down your social media planning down to very few minutes in the time. Like I have gotten a month worth of planning down to 30 minutes because I have those topics. All I have to do is go, okay, I need a testimonial. I go to my testimonial bank. I pull that and there it is. Okay, I need to talk about a service. Last month, I talked about public relations. So now this month, I need to talk about social media. It really does cut out of the guesswork of the folks that you hear that say, what am I going to talk about on social media today? We all have that. What am I going to talk about? It takes all of that guesswork out. And I think it really builds up in your customer's mind who you really are, what you do, and how you can help them. Those are really the three things that we have to continually embed into their mind, who we are, what we do, and how we can help them. 100%. And I can just tell you a little story about this. So my dear friend who we met on Instagram to talk about building relationships, and she's been on the show a couple of times. I've been on her show, but her name's Allison Scholes, and she is a, an Instagram coach per se. And one day, way back when I had her, this was the beginning of this year because I was so burnt out on social media. I was posting three times a week, but I was doing it on the fly, right? What am I going to post? What am I going to post? She sat down with me and she goes, here's what you need to do, Robin. And it was exactly like you just said. And she's, you have that as pillars. You don't need to be scrounging. She's, you've got your book, you've got the podcast, you've got your coaching, you've got the mindset. She like lists off these things. And I'm like, oh yeah, I have all those things. So since February, I have been creating a month of content at a time. I get that done. And it's like, I'm done. I feel like the world is just lifted off my shoulders. And it's amazing how much more meaningful the content Mm -hmm. is. And something she said is exactly what you said. Not to bring, not like, this is all about you today, but I have to bring this up because it just is, you know, how much more, like you said, you have, people have to hear things seven times, the rule of seven. And it's we can take things that we posted before because you have new followers, you have new eyes on your account. And most likely because only 2% of your audience sees what you post. Most of your audience hasn't seen what you posted two months ago. So repurpose it. Yes. Yes. So I love it. I love it. Such great recommendations, Allie. I just love it. And I think you really nailed the the biggest reward of planning content. And that is that feeling of being able to say, I don't have to worry about social media for an entire month because it's already planned. And I think even more so, I have been able to really identify what do I want to talk about next month? What is going to be my focus? And really being intentional about what those messages are 
And I find that I'm actually generating so much more valuable content for my clients, for my audience, because just to your point, when you're sitting there going, what am I going to post? You aren't thinking strategically. You're thinking, I just need to get this done. I need to check it off my list. And so whatever comes top of mind first, whereas when you can say, all right, I know I'm launching this in August, or I know I'm launching this in December. And so working backwards, what do I want to talk about the month before? And really taking those steps forwards, and then you can say, oh, wow, I need to break this down into three or four posts and make it a, a more of a series. That really opens up your mind and your and ideas to, to be able to talk about things in just a different way than we would have when we're just posting one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, so great. So great. And I will say that what you just said about that idea generation is mm -hmm. so much more enriched whenever you do this, because I just keep a notebook and I have, I make my list. And if I'm walking the dogs or whatever I'm doing, I'll actually just put it in the notes in my phone. And I can always refer back to that. But it's funny how I end up with so many ideas for the upcoming month that it rolls over to the next month. Now, like I've, when I did June's content, I basically got July's content done at the same time, because mm -hmm. all those things that I thought I could piggyback on that I had for June. Now just, I opened up other things on the list for July. So it's yes. really remarkable how, when you plan ahead, you not only solve a problem for yourself, but you're more likely to solve a problem for your audience and build better connections with them. And you feel better about your time management in the long run. It's a win-win for everybody, really. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is. Okay, Allie, this has been so great. I love everything that you have taught us today. And I appreciate you coming on so much. So do you have any last words of wisdom or tips that you want to leave the listeners with that will help them become more visible? Yeah, I think something that really helps and something that we tend to stay away from is having an opinion and taking a stand. And I truly feel when you can have an opinion, take a stand, you get more media opportunities, you get more attention on social media, your visibility increases and grows because you're either saying something that others wish they had the courage to say, or you're saying something that catches the attention of the opposing party and they want to have something to talk about. So if you really feel like you're stuck and you're in a position of, I don't really know how to get more visible. I know you've shared all these tips, but I don't know what to do next. Try taking a stand or having an opinion on a topic that comes up your way, because you will find that really opens up the door to visibility in the future. Mm, that is such great advice. And it's funny because when I first started, I was consuming so much stuff related to personal branding and this, that, and the other. And then when I became certified as a brand strategist, I learned so much more. And now my perspective of personal branding is totally different. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of times people will just hear things and see things and learn from someone and they adopt their perspective instead of diving deeper into their own perspective. And I know my perspective on a lot of things has changed over the years and which is totally fine because I think we're all morphing into who we're meant to be and it's all part of the journey, right? So you can backpedal a little bit, but just be sure you know exactly how you feel and what you stand for related to whatever ever is pertinent to your area of expertise. Comes back to that authenticity and truly owning who you are, standing up for who you are and not trying to be that middle ground, wishy-washy, I don't want to offend either party or either side, really owning that version of you. 100%. And I think the best way people can do that is adhering to their values. And mm -hmm. I'm going to just give one example here. I interviewed on a podcast not too long ago. And on my website, I say that I'm unapologetically a woman of faith and that faith is part of my business. That is one of my values. And I'm not willing to waver on that. And the listeners know I talk about God all the time and I always love me some Jesus. But anyway, my point being is that he said to me, so you have that on your website. Did you hesitate to do that at all? Were you afraid to do that? And I said, no, that's who I am. Like if I want to attract the right people to me, I want to attract people that have similar values. So if anyone out there is questioning how they can be genuine, how they can be authentic, look at your values and look at the visions for yourself, look at your passions and just make sure that those things are aligned because then you are able to be authentic. You're able to show 
your genuine self and not pretend that you're someone else. And I think that is really the key to being exactly what Ali just recommended. It gets easier too. Like you no longer have to wonder, should I say this? Should I not say this? Just to your point of if you can own your values and stand in who they are and and be confident in that, everything becomes easy at that point. Like nothing becomes a question. It is just who you are and how you feel. Yeah, absolutely. Allie, thank you so much for being here. Do you have anything else that you want to tell the listeners? Please tell them where they can find you, connect with you, learn more from you, work with you. You can find me on my website, IWantFameFortune.com. I've got some great freebies there that you can download to help you come up with pitches to send to the media, help you even got some media contacts there for you. So IWantFameFortune.com is going to be the hub for all of those resources. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And listeners, I will put Allie's links in the show notes. Please go over and hit up the show notes because I always link back to previous episodes that we referred to, the brands we refer to, all of those good things. So the show notes are always full with great value. So be sure and check those out. And that's it for today. So thanks everybody for being here. If you know someone that this episode could serve, please share it on your social platforms and tag Allie and I will put her social links in the show notes as well. And we'll see you next week.